Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another live stream with me, Martin Twycross. For all of those joining the street stream, it's lovely to have you on the stream. For those watching the replay, it's great that you can join us as well through the replay. Let me just bring up my chat screen, which has just disappeared, which will be fun if I can't see what's been posted in chat. So the live stream is a monthly live stream. It's an opportunity for you to ask me any questions you have on mediumship and development, and I will do my best to answer them to the best of my abilities. So if I know the answer, I will tell you. If I don't, I will be honest and say I don't. So you can start if you want loading your questions into the chat box. I can see we have a few already. So thank you, Jennifer, Dominique, Peter and Omar. Love you to see you there. So. As I say, the live stream, it's a, it's a live question answer class. I do it to support all my courses, my study program, uh, my products, so that if you have any questions on those, you can come and ask me questions. As always, I don't charge for this, but if you would like to donate via Super Chat or via PayPal Me, there is a PayPal Me link pinned to the top of the chat box and also you can use the super chat, which is enabled if you know how to do that. There's like a little dollar sign in the bottom of the chat box, which you can find. So since my last live question answer about four weeks ago, what have I put on the channel? So I put a, a video on the channel called Sitting in the Power, the Key to Mediumship, which I highly recommend if you've not seen it. I talk about in that, that's an extract from an interview I did, and it's about 20 minutes of how to do Sitting in the Power, why it's important and a lot more besides. And that complements the four classes that I brought out on Sitting in the Power, the Sitting in the Power playlist. Highly worth worthwhile looking at those. Also, I've released a video called How to Practice Mediumship, 10 tips. And many people said, you know, if you could give us, just distill it out into 10 key points, how to do mediumship, that's it. So uh, that's well worth checking out. Highly recommend that one. I also uploaded a meditation you can use to meet your loved ones, which many people have done and said how much they enjoy. And the last one I uploaded just a few days ago is a talk on being spiritual, a spiritualist address all about being spiritual. So that's the four new videos on the channel. If you've not seen them, do check them out. Uh, my current course that I'm running is Better Private Readings, and we've done classes one and two. All the courses are, are recorded, so if you've not signed up but you'd like to you can come in at any time and catch up with the replays and if you can't attend any of the classes live you can also catch them as well through the replays the recordings which are yours to keep for posterity many people keep asking me that question are there hours to keep and the answer is yes with all the courses classes teachings i offer study program everything i offer is yours for life i, I don't believe in putting a time limit on it you can have access for three months or six months or a year no if you bought it it's yours why wouldn't it be so as well, I do have my Facebook group, uh, Mediumship Teachings with Martin Twycross. If you've not checked that out, then do, do join that if you're on Facebook. And you can keep up to date with what comes out on my channel. You can keep up to date with all my quotes and all my other bits and pieces. And I usually post a reminder as well for the live stream there as well. So we've got a few questions building up. And a welcome to the Spiritualist channel and to MS Brit. Lovely to see you. So in a moment, I'm going to make a start. So generally, the live, the live q and it runs for up to two hours. It runs for as long as you keep asking me questions. But if you keep asking me too many questions, then we generally draw a line under it uh, for at the two hour point. Uh, as I say, if you would like to donate and support the channel, you can do that through Super Chat, through PayPal Me as well. All donations are gratefully received. I don't charge for this. I do this to help you. But if you would like to say thank you or buy me a coffee, you're always more than welcome. So let's get cracking with some of the questions. So the first question from Jennifer. I was wondering how to draw spirit closer for more evidence. And the idea of drawing spirit close to me can send the wrong impression to people because what we do when we do mediumship is we go to the spirit world. We go to blend with them. We don't stay where we are and say, come on spirit, you come and blend with me. It doesn't work that way. Some of you will be familiar with this little diagram that I have here. And this diagram basically shows the different states. You'll see we have the normal state in the middle. We have the passive states down below the line and we have in inspiration, healing and trance. But above the line, we have the active states you have the psychic level and you have the mediumship level. So mediumship is the most active of states. When we do mediumship, we've got to get really energized. We've got to get into it 
and we've really got to move ourselves to the spirit world. You'll often hear me say that power is the fuel for mediumship, but to connect to the spirit world, if you like, we have to use the ignition. Cars have a high voltage system to get the engine started. It's the same with mediumship. We have fuel for the mediumship, which is our power, but we've got to get connected to spirit and that takes energy. And that is the connection. That is the ignition, if you will. So your question then, how do we draw them closer for my evidence? So first of all, we've got to go to them. Then we, we invite them to work with us. When, when we're connected to spirit and we're well connected to spirit, we invite spirits who belong to your sitter to work with you. If it's not working particularly well, and I often use the radio analogy, we as mediums are radio receivers and spirits are on unique wavelengths. And, you know, are we the right wavelength for them? And if it's not, it's a bit hit and miss. If it's not brilliant, you can invite them closer. If it's not brilliant, you can send thoughts to your guides to change the conditions to make it work better, to help bridge that gap if they can do that for you. But just all we can do is invite them closer. We can't blend any closer to them other than taking ourselves and connecting ourselves to the spirit world. So that's the first part of your question. Second part of your question, how can I make my vibrational level higher to blend with them. So we say that the spirit world is at a higher vibrational level, higher vibrational frequency. And what we do ourselves is we have to move our energy to connect with them. We have to raise our vibration. How do you do that? There's a multitude of ways. Now I will mention at this point that I have a whole series of videos. You'll see that uh, class three, connecting with spirit is a two hour teaching video. That one, I go through all the different mechanisms that we can use. So in class three, so each one of those, each one costs about uh, 12, don't, don't cost about, they cost 12 pounds each. Each video costs 12 pounds each, and it's about two to two and a half hours of teaching. The techniques we use for getting ourselves, raising our vibration and connecting to spirit can range from visualizations, breathing techniques, affirmations, uh, intent. The intent and in prayer is really quite powerful. If we intend to connect, we can take ourselves to it. But just getting excited, getting energized, getting active, getting empowered. Some people to listen to very vibrant, exciting music before they work. Other people think about things that really make them excited to get in that energy and that power of the connection. But when we see a medium work upon a platform, the medium on the platform is like a hyper version of themselves. Many people who know me know my energy say, oh, when you're working as a medium, you're like, whoa, full on, hyper, manic. And that's how it is, that is the energy. We need to use our, our, our anxiety and flick that over into excitement. We need to reframe any anxiety we have of working with spirit into excitement because it is ever so exciting to work with spirit. So hopefully that asks answers the first question. Next question, uh, Dominique, any ideas on how to maintain a good balance between focusing on the afterlife and our time here? I say, I'm not really quite sure what nuance you mean by that. So you can throw a, another question, another comment in the, the chat box. Do you mean, you know, because when we're here, we're not generally focused on the afterlife. Do you mean uh, trying to balance our time between doing mediumship or having an interest in the afterlife versus an interest here? I'm assuming that's what you mean, unless you tell me otherwise in the chat box. And basically, uh, so, you know, we have to live in this world. If we can't live in this world and be grounded in this world and connected in this world, we're no earthly use to anybody. So we have to remember that we live in this world. We are of the earth. We are not in spirit yet. We shouldn't be trying to spend every moment of every day with spirit. We have to find the balance for ourselves. We have to get that balance right. Absolutely. That's what needs to happen. You know, and how do you do that? You just do that by grounding yourself and bringing yourself back to normal when you're not working and having strict discipline about when you are working and when you're not. Uh, you know, it's, there's no problem with having an interest and in reading about the afterlife and reading about mediumship and other various related topics. But we've got to be able to function with everybody here in this world. I know many people who get a bit carried away and who start talking in a strange language, you know, how are you today? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. My throat chakra has been playing up and my crown, all oh, the energy around my crown, my, my crown center. And I've been channeling Archangel Michael and all people go, what the heck are you on about? What are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. So 
you've got to be normal. You know, the, the strap line of my channel is practical down to earth teachings on mediumship and development. We've got to be down to earth. We've got to be normal. We've got to be able to function in this world. That's absolutely critical. If you find yourself becoming a bit too far that way, you need to then pull yourself back. So do check out the video I have on my channel called The Importance of Grounding. I don't define grounding as any practice like putting roots into the ground or going and hugging trees. What I define grounding as is returning yourself back to the normal state. Returning yourself from one of these other, alter, uh, other uh, altered states of awareness back to the normal level. That's what I define grounding as. So check that video out on my channel. Well worth looking at. So hopefully that answers your question. Next question. Peter, ha have you ever experienced a spirit who comes through different, th comes through during different readings? Yes, multiple times. Multiple times I've brought through the same people for people uh, who've either come for sit-ins or who come to demonstrations or services. Often I won't even know I brought them. Sometimes someone will come up to me and say, you know, my mum always communicates through you. And it's like, I don't remember having your mum at all. But there you go. Sometimes what will happen is one member of a family will come for a reading with you. You bring through a loved one. And then what happens is somebody else comes from that family in the hope of hearing from said loved one. And they come through again. But often, rather than triggering your mind with the same evidence, they'll appear in a totally different way. Spirit are very clever. They don't want our minds in the mix. So what happens is they come in a slightly different way. Only at the end of the sitting, the person will say, well, you gave a, a reading to my daughter about a month ago and you brought through the same person. And that was my husband. That was her father. And do you realise you brought them through again? It's like, no, I've got, I, I had no idea you were connected. I have no idea it's even the same person. And I tend to forget all my links anyway. I, I'm not one of these mediums who can remember. When I'm in the energy of spirit, in that altered state, my, my, I don't have a good recollection. People come up at the end of a service and say to me, oh, your second link, can I talk to you about it? And I'm like, I can't remember my second link. <laughs> You'll have to refresh my memory. What did I say? I said such and such. Oh, okay. And bits of it come back to me, but I, I don't remember. It's the nature of the altered state. So yes, it happens many times. Why would it not? Spirit will come through and the same spirit can come through multiple different mediums. And we've done exercises as well where I, I can connect to a spirit here whilst working in a class with somebody who's connecting to the spirit in the States or in Australia. We're both connecting to the same spirit at the same time in parallel. And I've seen it done with four different mediums in different locations, all linked in to the same spirit. No problem at all to do that. So, yes, that, that, that's not unusual. Okay, and welcome to Madeleef. Okay, Omar. If you work on your mediumship development, are the psychic senses also developed as a byproduct of mediumship development? Yes, yes. Basically, what we have is we have the psychic, we have the mediumistic. The mediumistic uses the psychic. So anytime you're doing mediumship, you're developing the psychic. But often we would recommend that people start by developing the psychic senses, developing the psychic apparatus, de developing their intuition, developing uh, their awareness. And we, in, in the UK, we start people in an awareness circle. And generally in the awareness circle, we use psychic exercises. And generally in an awareness circle, we give people gentle guided meditations to get to learn to use the psychic senses, to get to use clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, to taste and smell, all of that. We get them to work with basic, simple psychic exercises without a great deal of pressure. So they can get used to working with impressions that surface within them. And then we, once they get competent in the psychic, we move them on to mediumship. That's, that's the goal within the circles of teachings in churches, which I do myself and uh, have done for many, many years. But if you come and develop mediumship purely, and ignore all the psychic or don't have access to psychic development, what happens is you have to do the psychic development and the mediumship development in parallel. Someone who's very used to working psychically is used to receiving impressions and can work with that. So generally those who've gone through the beginner stages in our churches in the UK are reasonably able to do that. And then all they happen to do is learn to work with spirit. But if you happen to learn to work with impressions and learn to develop your psychic senses from scratch, it makes mediumship harder. So if you can do any pre-development, it's better. But if you can't, then mediumship, by its definition of using the psychic senses, will also 
help to unfold in the psychic within you to a degree. But many mediums neglect the psychic and ought to go back to the psychic. I know some people who were trained by Gordon Higginson. And he said to them that your mediumship is absolutely fine. It's the psychic you must work on because you have not spent enough time on the psychic. You've worked on the mediumship, but you haven't worked on the psychic. So we have to work on the two. And one of the most powerful tools is psychometry. Psychometry is a very powerful tool for working on the psychic. And mentioning videos, I do have one of my special topics called working with psychometry. Uh, one of the special topics, working with psychometry, again, it runs about two and a half hours if you're interested. Uh, and what I do is I talk about how psychometry works and I talk about how to do psychometry. I talk about all the theories that underpin psychometry because it is actually pretty fascinating, actually. You'd be amazed um, that one thing Gordon Higginson could do, if he had an object belonging to someone, he could pick it up and tune into them now. As if that object worked as a catalyst for being able to tap into them psychically in their lives now. So it wasn't just purely remembering memories from the object. It was about using it as, an, a, as something to, to help them, help, help connect him psychically with them in the now. So yeah, definitely. I, I highly recommend psychic development if you've not done a great deal of time on it. Okay, Kathy, what's your question? Do I do any mediumship readings for clients? I don't do a great deal at the moment, I'm afraid. I get a huge number of requests, but because of my other commitments with my teachings, my courses, classes, and the book I'm trying to write, I just really struggle to do it. And I had a waiting list, which is massive, and I'm still trying to clear that really. So I don't take on any new mediumship readings at the moment, I'm afraid, sorry. But there are loads of mediums who do, and if you want a reading, there's loads who will do one for you. Amar. You said mediumship cannot be done or practiced solo. From your perspective, if one is communicating with spirits solo, are they then channeling using psychic senses or something else? So, when I say mediumship cannot be done solo, what I mean is I'm talking about evidential mediumship uh, the mental mediumship that we know as evidential mediumship, where we gain evidence about a spirit communicator and giving it to a recipient. You cannot do that if you have no recipient. You cannot do that by yourself because you need someone to come forward whose loved ones you will then link for to connect them to them. Think about it. Why would spirit loved ones come to you if you're not in communication with their loved ones in that moment? They wouldn't. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'll take you back to my 10 tips for doing uh, mediumship, how to do mediumship, 10 tips on how to practice it. The video I, I put up recently. One of the tips is you've got to do it with a sitter. You cannot do it by yourself for that exact reason. It doesn't make any sense. Now, it gets complicated because can we blend with our own guides? Yes, we can. Can we blend with spirit? even though there's not a sitter present, you can, but there's got to be a good reason for it. For example, if I was had a few sittings booked on a day, I might be having a shower in the morning and I feel spirit come forward. And it's like, okay, who are you? Your dad, your dad, you had a heart attack. Okay, dad with a heart attack. If you want to step back, when your loved one comes, come back and work with me. And I have, I have that, and even on days when I'm going to do demonstrations. People come forward to join me early and it's like, no, 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 I don't need you now. Come back later. Step back and come back later when your loved one's there. Because what happens is if they come forward too early, their loved one doesn't make it to the sit the demonstration, doesn't make it to the sitting. Then you're left. If you give that information, it won't be taken. It won't work. So you, I always don't really like to work in that way. It can happen, though. This is why I'm telling you it can happen. I don't recommend people do that, but it can happen. So... But there has to be a way of getting that through to the person. Having said that, I've had people ring me up. Oh, your mum's been in touch and she's telling me this, that and the other. And I'll say, how do you know it's my mum? She told me it's mum. Well, what was the evidence? And then the time you say, that's not my mum. So, so really, that's not what you should be doing. If people ever do that to me, I, I generally they don't do it again. Because I'll tell them straight that, you know, that that is not appropriate. Never give a reason to anybody who was not asked for it. We don't do that. The ethics and responsibilities, we don't do that. So, yeah, so it can happen, but it's rare. So, then, can you communicate with your own guides? Yes, we call that inspiration. In my list, little list here, that's the inspiration level. We can receive it through inspirational writing. We can receive it through inspirational speaking. I can blend and attune with my guides and talk some 
words into a, a little dictaphone, that's possible. I can blend and attune my guides and do inspirational writing again, that's possible. I can blend with my guides in, in, in the, when I'm sitting in the power and receive some bits of inspiration or thoughts from them occasionally then as well. Or more often than not, I'll send a thought to the spirit world and when I'm least expecting it, I'll get it back. I'll get the inspiration back. Generally, if I'm having a shower and I'm daydreaming or I'm doing the dishes and I'm daydreaming, in pops the inspiration. I never get it in my normal, rational, logical state, always in an altered state of awareness. So coming back to your question, Amar. So if one's communicating with spirit solo, then remember, it, if it's evidential, you've got to have someone to check it out with. People who tell me that they're in contact with the spirit world, receiving all sorts of messages day in, day out, generally aren't. There's also a risk of our own imagination creeping in as well. Channeling is similar to inspirational working as well. Ch and we have trance. We also have trance down the bottom as well. But if you're, if you're doing trance, you're in a very passive state and usually trance work generally needs sitters. So it's generally inspiration. For me, channeling can be a form of inspirational speaking. But again, you've got to be channeling uh, knowledgeable entity. The acid test of trance and channeling is whether what is spoken from your mouth is of a caliber that far exceeds what you can do when you're in your normal rational thinking state. If you could do something similar in your normal eyes open state, then why, what's the point? You know, it, if I'm going to go into trance and bring forward words of wisdom from the spirit world by innate, allowing spirit to speak through me, I want it to be better than what I'm capable of, absolutely. If it isn't, I'm wasting my time. I might as well pack it up and go do something else. So that's the key. So it could, it could be channeling, it's, but it's not psychic. You know, if you're, if you're receiving, if you're doing mediumship, it's not psychic. Because psychic is linked to energies in this world. Psychic is linked to the energy of a person here, opposite you, or in the room with you. Psychic is linking to an object, like I mentioned with psychometry. Psychic is linking to the energy of places. You can walk into a room and feel the energy of the room. That's psychic. So it's not psychic. So hopefully that answers your question. Tony, Gordon Higginson said, the evidence of survival can be in the no rather than in the yes. Do you have examples from your own experience? So what, what he means by this, what Gordon Higginson means is, is that sometimes we get a no and the no can be meaningful. Uh, and some of the best evidence is where the recipient does not know it and says no to you, but has to go and check it out and checks it out that it's right. Because some people claim as mediums, we're just reading the energy of the person in front of us, or we're just reading that information psychically off them. But when it's working with spirit and we bring forward information that is correct, but it's not known, and the person says, I don't know, or no to you. Often they'll say no to you, but really the, the truth is, if we ask them to give us a yes, no, don't know, they would probably have given you a don't know rather than a no. So, for example, I know Gordon Higginson, uh, so a well-known medium went to watch Gordon Higginson demonstrate. And Gordon Higginson came to the lady, gave her all this information, and she said, no, don't know who that is. No, can't take any of it. Sorry, no. And Gordon said, I know I'm right. Go away and check it out and you'll find I'm right. The lady thought, no, I don't know who I can check it with. Don't know who that is at all. But strangely, a la a, an older lady was meant to have went to the demonstration with that lady and couldn't make it at the 11th hour. She had to pull out. She was ill. So when the lady said to her, oh, how was Gordon Higginson? She said, oh, he wasn't very good. He gave me this message. None of it made any sense. She said, well, what was it? And all of the information fitted the lady who was meant to come with her, but who couldn't come. So even though it was a whole bunch of no's, and even though she was saying to Gordon, you're wrong, Gordon was right. That's really what he means uh, when he says that. And a no is quite simply just information. A no doesn't, a lot of mediums go, I've got a no, I'm wrong, ah! And their confidence drops and it all goes to part and they start thinking I'm no good, it's not working, it's gone bad. But no, and all a no is, a no is just a piece of information to help you. So if you get a no, what does it mean? It means a person doesn't remember. It means the person doesn't understand. It means the person doesn't know. It could also mean you're wrong. It can mean you're wrong, or it could mean you're not quite right. So a no is an opportunity to go back into it, to feel back in. If I get a no, I don't go, okay, move on. I'll be like, okay, you give me a no to that. Let me go back into it. Okay, it's not, I haven't quite got it right, I can see. Let me, let me feel it, yeah, okay. So 
So I said that this gentleman had dementia and you're telling me no, but as I go back into it, okay, it now makes me aware there was a, a specific uh, event that triggered this problem of the brain. I feel it was a brain injury caused by a specific event. Yes. So the no, it's, the, it's a no tells us, okay, we've not got something quite right. It's our job to get back into the energy, the power of it and move into it and explore it and find it out to make it to, you know, to, to bring it back and see, can we present it in a different way? Sometimes it doesn't work, but I, I, you know, I go through all of that in my mediumship class eight, uh, managing problems in mediumship, mediumship class eight, managing problems in mediumship, which is also a part of module three of the study program as well, for those who are interested in my study program. So the study program, there's four modules. They, they use the classes from the videos and they also include tutorials. So each module is five videos and five t accompanying tutorials. The tutorials answer about 30 questions on each video. So they really drill in deeper into the information. So if you're interested in that, you, you can check those out. So yeah, so we get a no, but we've got to work with the no. We'll get more from working with our no's than we will with the yeses because the no's help us to understand our mediumship, help us to understand the nuances of when we're not getting it quite right. And it can, and the no's can be highly evidential, as Gordon mentions. So, you know, sometimes we give the thing and say no to us and we say, go and check it out and see, see if you can, you know, check it out and let me know. And they'll come back a week later and say, I checked it out and you were dead right. My mum knew who you had. I didn't know. I didn't know that side of the family, but mum says you were dead right. So there you are. And then we find out as a medium that, you know what? We are accurate. We find out as a medium that what seemed to be a no is actually a yes. But it shows that we're not reading someone psychically. That's the key. Okay, so Peter, you're saying the same spirit shows up very frequently regardless of the sitter. Now that doesn't make sense to me because think about it. Why would spirit come forward if the person they need to come forward for is not present in front of them? Simply tell them not to bother. And remember, when you're working, you ask for communicators for your sitter. You don't just open to anyone because you might just get anyone. So, and first of all, check it's not one of your own loved ones, because <laughs> that, that can happen as well. Oh, hang on, no, oh, this is all my loved one, never mind. But no, whenever I'm working, if there's someone in front of me, I ask sitters for this person and this person only. Communicate, sorry, communicate some spirit for this person in front of me, the sitter in front of me. That's what we want. If I'm doing a dem, it's communicators who come for this audience. That's what I want. Nobody else. And I, so if we stick to that and we're disciplined, you shouldn't get that at all. It doesn't make sense. Holly asks, how often do guides come through? Um, well, guides basically will come when you ask them to come. Guides will blend with you when you ask them to blend. But you've got to learn to receive inspiration from your guides. You know, it's not simply a case of guides can just suddenly instantly appear. Guides have to learn to work with you as you have to learn to work with them. So you've got to give it time. And guides work primarily through the inspirational level, not the evidential mediumship level. It's not the same way to connect to a guide as I connect to loved ones in the spirit world. It's different. I connect to a guide through the more passive state. The inspirational state, this is a passive state, it's an inspirational state. It's the, the state of inspirational writing, inspirational speaking, inspirational art, spirit art, all the inspirational music, it all comes on that inspirational vibration. So yeah, but you know, God, I, I'm not aware of my guides bringing me inspiration unless I'm asking for it. So, you know, they're not gonna intrude upon me, knock on my, Come in, Martin, where we want to connect with you. No, it's my job to connect with them. And but remember, often we do not get a, a conversation with our guides. I don't have a conversation with my guides. I send them thoughts and then I receive the answer. But there's that time delay. I can I can send them a thought and try and do an inspirational writing session or speaking session to bring an answer. But it can be heavily contaminated by my own desires, my own wants, my own mind. So it's better to leave the time and let it come when it comes. But I also sit in trance. I, and to do trance work, we, we learned to do it over many years. I've been sitting for trance for over 12 years now. And we sit several times per month and sat hundreds of times. 
And if spirit want to communicate, my guides come and communicate through the trance. And I record the trance so I can hear it back myself and I can hear what they want to say to me. That's how my guides come to me. But again, your mileage may vary. But generally, those who portray it, oh, talk to your guides and have a conversation and we're having a rat old chin wag. A lot of that will be your imagination, I'm afraid, because it doesn't work like that in reality. And if it does, I think you've got to question it a little bit because... The, 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 you know, the problem there is what happens is our own imagination throws in an answer. It's like we say something and we want to reply back. So if we don't get it back, we can't receive it through inspiration. Whoosh. It comes from our own mind. You've got to be very careful. Very careful. Holly, I had another medium tell me that my God is a cosmic energy. energy. Have you ever heard that before? No. Now, certain things, you'll see me, my energy begin to go... <sighs> You'll see me begin to groan. Remember my strap line, practical down to earth teachings on mediumship and development. What the heck does a cosmic energy mean? It's BS, basically. It's complete crap. Spirit are in the spirit world. They're not cosmic beings. Then, you know, what happens is we, we generally, a lot of people portray guides as archetypes, Native Americans, monks, Aborigines, etc., Egyptians. What have you. you? You take your pick. I don't personally have my guides portray themselves in that way at all. And I don't want it like that neither because it's very limiting. And the problem is mediums love to tell people all, all sorts of things about guides. I often have an expression, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I'll, I'll, I'll upset a few. Um, that basically those who do communicate with spirit, those who can't give you your guides and just tell you all sorts of crap about yourself, like, oh, you've got a lovely spiritual energy, or your aura shines so bright. I can see the lovely colour purple in your aura. It matches your shirt, Martin. You're such a lovely spiritual person. You know, that's a nice reading, isn't it? But it's fluff. <laughs> it's flaky. Where's, where's the reality of that? I'd rather you give me my mum. Tell me I should pass. Give me her name. Tell me she knows exactly what's going on around a certain member of family at the moment. And I'm like, yes, now that's what I call a proper reading. But if you just tell me you've got a guide with you, he's a, he's a Native American and he's got, his name is Running Water. And, you know, honestly, really, I've been given guides from Aborigines to Zulus and everything in between. And most of it, if I'm honest, is complete piffle, complete rubbish. None of it really matches who my guides are at all. And mediums just do it because they've got nothing better to talk about, I believe, or they think that that's what should happen. So there you go. I've probably upset a few people there. Never mind, eh? But yeah. So the fact you've got a cosmic energy, I would never say that. I've never heard it. I can't see the point of it. But hey, mediums will tell you all sorts. <laughs> Dominique, thank you, Martin. My question answered. I'm glad. Samadhi. I love your, thanks for your videos. You're more than welcome. Spiritualist channel. Can you do psychometry on a person who has passed over with a personal item of theirs? Yes, but that, you've got to be careful. The differentiation between psychometry and mediumship. Can we use an article to help us connect to the person? Yes, but that's not psychometry. Basically all you do, someone, here's my grand's watch. You don't take it and say, OK, let me get the let me find out all about your grand from the watch. That's psychometry. As I'm holding the watch, I feel your grand was a lovely, gentle soul. Yes, that's correct. As I'm holding this watch, I know your grand had problems with her breathing. Yes, that's right. That is not mediumship. That is psychometry through holding the watch. However, with psychometry, what you end up reading is the person who's handled the watch the most recently. So if that watch has not been touched hardly since grand had it, then yes, it's got impregnated with Grand's energy. If somebody else has worn that watch, then it's not. It's impregnated with the current person's energy. So you'll pick up the last person to handle it generally. But that's psychometry. That happens regularly. People give me an article belong to someone and yeah, I can do that. I don't do psychometry in readings very often at all, but it can be done. But if you gave me an article belong to someone, I would just say, okay, that's the person you want. I'll put it down now. So whoever that watch belongs to, please come and link with me. That's mediumship. I can hold the watch and they can come and link me through mediumship. It's got nothing to do with the watch or the article or the object. The object does not somehow create the connection. All you're asking for is whoever that belongs to, would you like to come and work with me? Same with a photograph. Someone shows me a photograph of their loved one in spirit. I don't need to hold it and read the photograph. No. All I need to do is say, if you're available from the spirit world and you can join me now, please do so. I'd like to work with you. 
And if you can't, that's okay too. Whoever comes forward, comes forward. Remember, we have no guarantees with mediumship. If a medium can guarantee you a communicator, generally you've got to worry about that because in my experience, it's just not possible to do so. So there you go. Right, next question. <laughs> Dominique, if we need to take ourselves up to the level of spirit, how come they sometimes approach and interact us when we are not expecting them? Example, while going on about our day-to-day -day activities. Um, now, for me, the only spirit loved ones will not come and bother me generally unless I'm moving into an altered state because mediumship functions through the altered state. And they will not come and bother me unless I'm going to be able to link them to their loved one later that day, generally. They won't come a week in advance. I forget who they were then. They'd come on the day. So generally, for evidential mediumship, they don't blend with us unless there's a way of getting to their loved ones. That's important to recognise. Who can interact with you on your day-to-day -day activities? If you're in an altered state, remember, you can receive inspiration from your guides. And again, it depends on what your belief system is. But I don't believe people can regularly talk to spirit like that if there's no reason for it. You know, I, I've met people who uh, tell me, oh, I, I talk to spirit 24-7. I'm in constant contact with spirit 24-7. And they'll come to a class and must do mediumship and they can't do it. And what it tells me is it's their own mind creation. And we have to think about this and be honest about it because it's quite possible for our imagination to create it. it it's possible as well. That's another possibility. But if it is from spirit, and it's evidential mediumship, it should check out and it should be a way of getting it to the loved one. Absolutely. But remember, you never give readings unsolicited. You don't give a reading to someone who's not asked for it. And spirit should also follow that if you ask them to do that. So other than that, it could be a guide. But again, but spirit generally don't show up in our normal state. The people I know who have people speaking to them all their time in their normal state, sad to say, it's often... Uh, an, a, an issue uh, of psychosis or often an issue of hallucination or often, uh, you know, it can be mental health conditions like schizophrenia. So we have to we remember they're all in the mix as well. There's a lot of things in the mix. So, yeah, but whatever you get, you get. So don't let me, what I say, you know, deny you your experience. We all get our own experience. Okay, Annette, how do we stay in our power by practicing during a public reading? Now, a public reading, I'm assuming you mean during a demonstration. Uh, so in a demonstration of mediumship, how do you stay in your power? You just learn to hold the connection with spirit. And if you drop it, you just get straight back in and hold it. And if you drop it, you get straight back in and hold it. The best training is sitting in the power to do, to learn, to constantly reconnect with spirit. But you've got to build power. If you haven't gotten the power, you're not going to be able to stay in your power because it's going to just deplete. Whoosh. So you've got to build power. You build power through sitting for spirit, doing sitting the power, and you build power through practicing mediumship. The more you practice it, the longer you can work for. The more you do it, the longer you can work for. It's like building a spiritual stamina. But sitting in the power, if you like, is the shortcut to building a greater amount of power. But it's not really a shortcut because the, the, it's a logical practice that builds power. But if you don't do sitting in the power because you haven't got time, you don't want to, then yeah, you'll have to do it through practice and it'll be a slower process. Don't be surprised if people who sit in the power can overtake you in that process. But yeah, simply, how do you stay in your power? By staying connected to spirit. There is nothing more complicated than that because when we're connected to spirit, we're burning power. If, the, if we lose the connection, we just get straight back in. But if we've lost all of our power, we've got to build more. You know, when you first start, you can't, you know, beginners work for minutes, one or two minutes when a complete beginner starting, they can't hold the link long. After a while in classes, they can do 10 minutes. After a while, they might be able to get to 20 minutes. But then, you know, it takes a bit of effort to get up to 30 minutes or an hour of doing mediumship, but to do an hour and a half of mediumship, it takes a lot of effort, practice, development to build that level of power to work for an hour and a half. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Holly, I'm a big fan of the Seth books and you mentioned them in a previous Q&A. Do you think they are accurate in your experience? Now, I, I read them years ago, 15, 20 years ago. 
So to be honest, I don't know because I'm not familiar with them recently. So it's not a question I can answer. Um, so sorry about that because I can't remember what was said. Okay, I can't pronounce your name, but the question you've asked is how could we gain more confidence in ourselves and rate in the power when we get ne back negative feedback? How can we tell it's not our imagination? Yeah, and this is the thing. Is it, is, it, is it real or is it my imagination? If it can't be taken, if you, everything you give can never be taken, you've got problems. You really do. So I know people who think they're mediums and they stand on a platform and they give stuff and it's not understood. Or they give a sit-in and it's not understood. And if, if that happens all the time, quite simply, they're not a medium. Whether they believe themselves to be or not, or advertise themselves to be or not, they're not a medium. If you're working, and your work is never understood. It doesn't make sense. You should never have got on the platform in the first place until you get to the point whereby it's understood. So if you're doing a sitting, you should be asking for communicator for your sitter. If you're doing platform, you should be asking for communicators who belong to the audience. And the information you get should be understood. That's what we want. If you're in practice sessions, some of it won't be quite right. You're gonna get it wrong. You know, we start, maybe by getting 30% right and 70% wrong. And then we get 50% right and 50% wrong. And then it flicks the other way, we get 70% right and 30% wrong. And then it gets 80% right and 20% wrong as we get better and better and better. But we all mediums get a bit wrong. I think it was Gordon Higginson who said that, mediums who get sort of, you know, a good medium should be getting 70% plus right all the time. And a really good medium is kind of like 90% all the time. That's what you're really chasing. So. Accept you're not going to get certain things right. Accept that in your development. That's part of your training and development. But it gives you feedback. Just like the no gives you feedback, it gives you feedback about self. Now, if you put yourself up as a medium and you work for somebody and you, they can't take anything that you do, then you're going to get some negative feedback about it. And you've got to then question what's taking place. I, I've seen mediums work and every link is not understood. And I think, geez, if I ever got to that situation, I'd go back to basics. I'd stop my public work. I'd go back to basics. I would sit with spirit. I'd be, spirit, what's happening? What's changed? What needs to change? What needs to happen? Because we've got to get it right. But in your development stage, yes, things are, you are going to get negative feedback. Now, the thing to remember with confidence and negative feedback is how much weight do you give the negative feedback? You do 10 exercises in class. 10 exercises work really well. Or nine work really well and one doesn't work well at all. And the one doesn't work. So what do you do? You beat yourself up over the one. You, you slap yourself, flagellate yourself, beat yourself up over that one. You ignore the 90% that work. Oh no, that's, that's a given. That should work. It's a given. But you beat yourself up over the bit you didn't get right. And I see that commonly with people who lack confidence. They latch onto the bits that don't work. Or they latch onto the bits they get that, that it's not so positive. And then they get hung up upon it. So that be careful with that. Um, and when we're working and it's not working, it's, uh, oh, what do we do? We go, oh, this is not working. And what happens? We take ourselves away from the spirit world. So what have you got to do? This is not working, but you've got to still hold your connection and keep going with it. Do not allow no's. Do not allow that. I'm not understanding this to make you go, oh, well, that's, I'm, I'm not a medium then. And that's what happens with a lot of people. If they lack the confidence you know you've, you've got to you've got to use logic though and look to see is it right but if i'm working with someone and it's not working I, okay that's that link's not being understood with a sitter i'm working for okay you can't take it well remember what i've said if it checks out great but i'll say okay thank you for coming can i have somebody else who is understood and let's try another one okay that one is so again we've got to work with what's happening in the moment if it's if it's not working let it go get a new one start again so hopefully that will help you in some way. Okay. Soju. Do you see spirits with your eyes open? I've only seen spirits a few times. We see spirits in our minds subjectively. So what that means is we are not seeing them physically in the room. Some people occasionally see that, but it's very, very, very rare. I've never seen it yet. And most mediums I know don't see it at all. Some what I know people who've seen it maybe once or twice. If you read the Gordon Higginson book on the side of angels, 
He talks about when he went to Stansted Hall and a monk came to speak to them. And this monk disappeared afterwards. Now that is seeing spirit objectively as if they're real flesh and blood and you could poke them and you believe them to be real. But otherwise we often create them within our mind and we can project them out. Now, do you need to have your eyes shut to see spirit? No, of course not. When I'm working on platform, I don't have my eyes shut ever. If you, if you come to any of my classes and you shut your eyes, I'll tell you off because it's a bad habit to develop. I know some people who can only work when their eyes are shut because they believe that helps them to see spirit, but it doesn't. Spirit work within the screen of your mind. Just like you can imagine a red door now within your mind, a red door. You don't have to shut your eyes to imagine the red door. It's there, it's projected on the screen of your mind. So when we're working with mediumship, we see spirit in our mind. But it's, it's, whether we have our eyes open or not is immaterial. But if you're talking about seeing spirit out in the room, seeing spirit objectively, then that's very rare. It said the average medium only sees spirit in their lifetime once. The average medium is very, very rare. As I say, I've never seen it in 20 years of development. And if I did see it, to be quite honest, I'd probably jump a mile in the air. I'd probably be... <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably run away saying, oi, don't do that to me. <laughs> you can come subjectively in my mind and I know your spirit. But if you show yourself in the room, I think I've got an intruder and I won't be happy. I think I've got burglars or something going on odd. So, yeah. Yeah, and I would say if you are going to show themselves physically within the room, then do it during daylight hours and don't do it at a scary time of day. <laughs> so there we go. Next question. Dawn, if my, if say my dad in spirit chooses to reincarnate, would a medium still be able to bring him through or is he not contactable as he now another spirit? Now, reincarnation is a huge topic and the way most people consider reincarnation is massively oversimplistic. The idea of you go to the spirit world and then you choose to come back to the earth and have another life. And that's not how it works generally. Um, so if, when, when people have asked spirit guides about reincarnation, they don't say it's a hamster wheel. And if you're, f and it's not your, it's not your dad that reincarnates. It's another aspect of the soul that your dad is that reincarnates. The fragment aspect of soul that dad is continues on in the spirit world and is quite capable of communicating with you. I've never come across any spirit yet who can't come back through a medium to communicate. Some people say, well, if they've been in spirit for 50 years, does that mean they can't communicate? The answer is no. I never come across any spirit who's reincarnated and can't communicate. So every spirit can communicate. That tells us that even if there is such a thing as reincarnation, but uh, the way I think it's taught or, or portrayed is overly simplistic, then if there is such a thing, then the aspect of your father or the aspect of that person you know continues because they can come back to you. But if you like... For me, it's what I call the fragmented soul theory uh, that we have a, an oversoul and we have aspects of within that soul. And oh, it's like facets of a diamond. Remember, the diamond is the, the, the totality of the soul, but each face is a life of that soul. So the facet, the face of that diamond that was your father continues to exist independently within that diamond. But if that soul chooses to partake of another life, then it's a different, a different face, a different facet that is continuing on. I don't know if that makes sense to you. I don't know if you can see what I'm trying to say with that. I'm looking around me to see if I've got any crystals or anything to hand, but I haven't, so that I can't even show you something. So look, I've got lots of faces, but you get the idea. Or if I was to show you a Rubik's Cube and I showed you a side of a Rubik's Cube, there'd be nine, nine coloured dots and nine coloured dots on the other one. Each one of them could be an independent life of that soul group or that over soul. So, but the, 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 the coloured square that is your loved one continues independently. Once created, you can never be destroyed. Once created, you continue in the spirit world as the same person you are now. You can't suddenly change into another person. It's not possible. And if you choose to have further life experiences, then you still remain who you are. And even if you continue to have further life experiences, you're still able to communicate back through a medium. So I hope that answers it. So, so, several people have asked me if I will do uh, a, a video, sh a short teaching video for my YouTube channel on reincarnation. And, and I'd like to, 
but I can't think of how to get it across in a very simplistic way, in a very short way. Because, you know, I don't like to go on for too long in my videos, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I might have to do it across a few different aspects of reincarnation. So, yeah, at some stage I will do something on reincarnation. I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> Holly, my teacher is saying I'm ready to do platform readings, but I don't feel ready. How can I prepare? I think all of us as mediums, if we are grounded mediums and not egotistical mediums, generally don't feel we're, we're, we're ready to do it. That's normal. I'm, I, I, I started development and 18 months later, my uh, teacher said, you, I think you should come on platform with me and do platform with me on the next next church I'm doing and I was like really and I was like I'm not ready to do platform yet and she's like I think you are and I'm like no I'm not and she's like I think you are and, and I went along and I did it and it was all right it wasn't brilliant but you know I felt afterwards I'm still not probably right ready to do it but it was a starting point and we learn from it and we move forward from it but I know other people who are I'm brilliant I'm I'm, I'm ringing around asking everyone to book me and they get bookings I, I know some mediums who before they're ready have pushed so hard, they've got a lot of bookings. And generally what happens is things fall over and things go backwards. And I know many mediums who encounter a lot of challenges. I know mediums who've pulled away from mediumship and walked away because they didn't put the foundations in place before moving on, before they then started to do public work. Remember, if you're gonna go public, you've gotta be able to handle the rough with the smooth. For every person who says that was lovely, you brought through my loved one, it was really good. Somebody else will say, that wasn't much good. That medium tonight was lousy. That medium tonight was rubbish. You've got to be able to take the rough with the smooth. If that's going to upset you, you're not ready. So you've got to be willing to, and if, it, if you have a bad night, you've got to be able to cope with it. So you've got to recognize that as well. But how do you prepare for work and platform? You know, it's no different to doing any other work, is it? You just, you know, there's no different preparation you can do for platform than if you were doing it for a, a practice session. It's all the same. Yeah, mediumship, I, I don't prepare for doing mediumship any different from how I do a sitting. It's all the same. It's mediumship. I have to, I build power. I build power. I tune to spirit. I set my intent with spirit and then I work. Simple as. You, so, yeah, there's no special preparation needed. But sometimes some mediums tell us we're ready when we're not. So you also have to ask the question. And I want to put this into everyone's minds. Uh... You know, has your tutor developed mediums and got a lot of mediums on the circuit? If they haven't and they tell you you're ready, then for me, there's a little caution warning sign in there, in there as well. Because if the people they've developed don't go on to become mediumship, mediums on the circuit themselves, then that worries me. I know a lot of people who teach people, but never ever develop mediums who go on to work on platform or mediums who go on to do sit-ins and become a, a good medium. So what I'm trying to say to you is sometimes some teachers will over promote a student when it's not the right time. Uh, if you have other teachers, you can always ask a second opinion. I know sometimes I would, my, my local teacher would tell me one thing. I'd go to college for a week at the Arthur Vindley College as a student. And at the end of the week, I'd ask the tutor what they thought and get that second opinion. Or I'd have a, I'd have a spiritual assessment and get a second opinion. But the, the acid test of whether you're ready to work public is when you're doing things like an open platform or doing it in class in front of an audience, do you get the vast majority understood and taken? And is the vast majority of your evidence understood and taken? If the answer to that is no, I'd say you're not ready to go public. We shouldn't go public until we're getting the majority of our links placed and we shouldn't go public until the majority of our evidence is understood. That's, that's what I teach to my students. So hopefully that makes sense. So you, I saw spirits twice objectively, but fortunately it wasn't scary. I'm glad about that. <laughs> H.K. Crumb, what is the spirits that can physically connect with people, like children being grabbed or pushed or spirit moving people out of dangerous situations like being hit by a car? Um, now, spirit generally cannot interfere with us in this world. It's very, very rare for spirit to be able to do that. And 
I've never been grabbed, pushed, or hit or anything by spirit. In 20 years, nothing like that. However, once I was driving my car on a motorway, on a, uh, I don't know what you call it in the States, but anyway, on a highway. And I was coming off uh, uh, the highway and I'm down the inside of this lorry. And in my head, I was told, brake. And I was like, whoa. So I hit the brake. I looked behind me to make sure there's no one behind me. And we hit me. And I hit the brakes. And then the lorry just pulled ahead and one of its tyres just blew out. And I thought, oh, well. This has had a blowout, but I didn't realise how serious lorry blowouts are because lorry blowouts can cause serious damage to cars, to people, can, you know, could have caused, could cause an accident and death even. So I believe that at that moment in time, something happened that spirit just projected that thought to me, to interfere with me, to help me. So in certain situations, it can happen. Harry Edwards, the great healer, Harry Edwards, uh, in one of his books, he talks about one day he stepped off a tram in London absent-mindedly. And literally, just as he stepped off a tram, there was a tram just bearing down on him. And he thought, oh my God, I'm going to be hit and killed or seriously injured. And in that moment, he was moved to the side of the pavement. In that moment, he, he was moved and missed the tram missed him. And he didn't move himself and spirit moved him. So it is possible possible but very 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 rare um, and I believe it only happens in situations of life or death when the medium if something happened the medium's work on this earth may no longer be able to continue so the guides who work with them are allowed to interfere only in absolute emergency life or death situations that's what I believe so it's like your your spirit guides your helpers, your guardian angels, call them what you will, are able to intervene at that moment. But generally they're not. But if, you know, some people say to me, oh, my, 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 there's a spirit in the house and my daughter was poked. Well, in those situations, generally it's not because there's, it's not life or death, obviously. And we have to understand it can be the child's imagination, can be all sorts of things in the mix. And the experience may not be, be as it is portrayed. That's the thing to bear in mind. So it can happen. But it, generally, it would be your guides and helpers that do it under absolutely rare circumstances. Anna, could you give us some tips for automatic writing or trans mediumship? So for trans mediumship and for inspirational speaking and writing, what I will tell you as well is that there are two special topics videos covering those ones. For trans mediumship, there's the, the one at the very top there on the special topic side is called trans mediumship about two and a half hours or maybe three even of how you go about developing trance. If you look down there as well, you'll see there's one called working with spirit inspiration and working with spirit inspiration gives advice for working with inspirational speaking and inspirational writing, which many people incorrectly term automatic writing. I don't use that term very often and I'll explain for you why. So for me, automatic writing is where the hand moves and words are written that you don't even know what's taking place or happening. You know, you don't even know what is being written until you look at the paper and see what's being written. That's automatic. It's called automatic because it's happening independent of your mind. Important to recognize that. When we're doing uh, inspirational work, what tends to happen is that we, what we get is like an idea or a thought or a word and then we get several words and then we get a flow. So this is te what tends to happen in inspirational work. We tend to get an idea, a thought or, or a single word. And then we get a few words strung together or possibly a few ideas that come in together. And then we can get a flow of ideas, a flow of words. And with inspirational work as well, what tends to happen is, is that to begin with, we get the idea and we write it out ourselves. We are writing it out. The idea comes to my, into my mind that love is the answer to all things. So I might write love is the answer to all things. It's not that that was automatic writing. My hand did it of it all in a code. I got the thoughts inspirationally within my mind. And then the next thought might come into that we are born into love and we go into love. Again, that's thoughts received 
inspirationally that I will continue to write down. And then it may begin to develop a flow. Then the idea might come to me that without love, a child will not thrive. Again, these are ideas or words coming to me, strings of words, really. And again, I'd write it down. But as we learn to develop and work with inspiration over time, it progresses even more to the extent that the flow starts to flow more quickly. And, and then what happens is ultimately you write the words out as you're receiving them. And ultimately what happens is you end up writing words out that you're not even conscious of. And that's when we're moving more into automatic writing. But to get to that point, you've got to work through that whole process of inspiration, which takes time and effort and dedication. Like any form of mediumship, inspirational mediumship takes time. So when we're doing trance, it's the same in the form of speaking. We should be do, learning to do inspirational speaking first. We should learn to do inspirational speaking and inspirational speaking with our eyes open on a platform or inspiration speaking in a group with our eyes open and making a connection with spirit and then letting the flow come through us inspirationally. Again, you often, I, what I'm doing in address, sometimes I just get the ideas I'm talking about, but it's Martin speaking. It's Martin clothing those ideas in words. It's Martin talking. But then I get to a point whereby the ideas are flowing through me and I'm just saying the ideas. And then we get to a point where I'm saying things and the ideas are unfolding within it, almost unconscious to my own mind. And that's when you're getting into the very strong inspiration. And then the extension of that is something we call overshadowing and channeling as a version of that in the US, I would assume. And then if you want to sit to develop trance properly, it's eyes shut and we're going very passive. We let spirit blend with us and spirit will bring their characteristics through and speak through us. And, uh, and again, then we don't have the control over the words being spoken. The words being spoken are all coming from the spirit world. They generally will use the, the vocabulary of our mind, of our subconscious mind to clothe what comes forward. But developing trance is a much longer process. Uh, there is a trance development interview that I have on my channel that I will, you can look at that has got lots of good advice for developing trance. But if you want to get the real depth, then as I say, there's the, uh, there's a two and a half hour, three hour teaching video that I do. And there's also the one of the modules of the study program, the special module healing, inspiration and trance that covers all about guides and helpers, because that's who you're working with in, with inspiration and trance. And then there's working with inspiration, the spirit, he spirit healing, trance mediumship, and also trance healing, where we're combining the trance and the healing to deepen the healing and get better results. So that's a really interesting module if those topics appeal to you. So if you're enjoying the vid this, um, this uh, class so far, then do give me a like, hit the like button. Do leave a comment as well. If there's anything you'd like me to talk about in my YouTube videos, again, leave me a comment as well. I'd like to know any more topics you'd all like me to talk about in any of those videos and get into depth. Uh, <laughs> just spotted a question. I uh, distracted myself by looking at a question. Again, if you're enjoying this and you would like to contribute uh, today to the channel, buy me a coffee. And there is Super Chat enabled. You can click on Super Chat. There is also PayPal me link pinned to the very top of the chat box that you can click on as well. Make a donation through PayPal. So as well, if you do ask a question through Super Chat, I will make that the next question I'm answering. So rather than if you want to wait to have your questions answered, if you want to do a Super Chat payment or answer a question, ask a question through Super Chat, you can do that as well. And generally, I answer those questions next. OK, so let me continue. Where was I? So I think we covered off automatic writing and trance. Tanya, what's your experience when a living person comes through? I received a message as a sitter and the spirit communicator is still living. The how and the why. Well, basically, there is a whole video on my channel about can the living communicate through a medium? So I'm not going to give you the whole 15 minutes now. I'm going to give you the quick edited highlights. It can happen when someone is very close to death. Where someone's moving into that point of transitioning, it can happen. I've given people who were the day before they passed, they've come through me. If somebody is in a coma, it can happen. If somebody has advanced dementia or Alzheimer's disease, it can happen. If someone's got a serious brain injury where their ability to function in this world is severely impaired, it can happen there. So generally, in those situations, people have a foot in both worlds. They're able to communicate through a, a, a medium. And they're not in spirit, 
It's just that an aspect of them can function independently of the body here, like spirit. Also, it's possible to get information about people who are living. It's possible to get people information about people living, but sometimes spirit gives us information about people living for it to direct, direct our attention to them. And what happens with that is, it's like, well, they're still alive, and then I will always check out, they're not in a coma, they're not close to death, there's none of those things fit, no. Okay, is there somebody else behind this giving me this communication? And sometimes what happens is, if a person from spirit, if they came forward and told you about themselves, the person in the audience might not be able to remember or recollect them or wouldn't necessarily think of them. So they might bring information about somebody here to make the connection to be remembered. Or they may be bringing information about somebody here because then the person here needs a great deal of healing or it needs you to get in touch with them here. But what happens in that situation is we say, OK, who's behind the communication? And then a whole bunch of different information comes in. Ah, and that's the communicator. That's who we're bringing through. But they give us information about somebody here. Often it can be information about the sitter in the audience. And I give all this information. Someone will say, you know, I can take all of that, but you're talking about me. It's not spirit. It's like, OK, so I'm with you. Now let's see who's communicating. And spirit will do that to help get us to a, a, a sitter as well in our audience. So they can work in all those ways. So I go through it in great detail in kind of medium link with the living on my channel. So I will post a link to that into the description of this video a little bit later. But that's the that's the quick version, if you like. It can happen. So you, I think you would re explain reincarnation very well. Glad you enjoyed it. Glad you found it helpful. It's even more complicated than that, to be truthful. That was, if you like, the simplified version of it. My guides have spoken about reincarnation at length, and uh, it's, I, I, I always feel I'm doing them a disservice if I can't bring in the complexity and ideas they bring in. But remember what I said? In the trance state, it should be capable of what we can, more than what we can do in our normal state. So I can't do justice to their concepts and ideas in my normal state because it was coming through in trance, which is more powerful, obviously. Spiritualist channel, explain the multiverse quantum physics in reincarnation. Now, again, I don't really subscribe to these ideas, I'm afraid. It, you know, the problem is, is we can create theories to explain things that just, oh, you know, I, I studied physics. I've got a degree in physics. So I do understand quantum mechanics pretty well, but I don't like to muck about with trying to overlay it with, uh, with mediumship and with the spirit world and ideas like reincarnation. I'll tell you for why, because it makes it more complicated. It may, you know, I believe in trying to keep things as simple as possible to be understood. And, you know, I, I don't believe for one minute this, this idea that we exist in parallel in, a mul in a multiverses, multiple universes where you exist and are having independent experiences in parallel. There's some stage there's one of you who's a complete genius and there's one of you who's a complete idiot, dunce. I don't believe, it doesn't make sense to me. None of it makes sense to me. So those ideas, I can't really explain them to you because I don't subscribe to them at all. So I'll be honest, I can't. And if I was talking about reincarnation, I wouldn't be mentioning them neither. So I believe that we exist and we, we don't, I don't believe all time exists at the same time. That's another idea that I think is, is a red herring. Because what happens is all time exists sequentially. Actions happen and have consequences. We move from development from point A to B to C to D. We can't suddenly go from A to D, back to C, back to B and all over the place. Like in this world, things follow sequentially. But in this world, things follow a fixed earthly time. In the spirit world, time is more flexible. Time is more malleable. Time can be compressed or expanded as needed. But still, things follow sequentially. We develop spiritually, sequentially. We don't lose the development we've had, but then the next experience helps our growth and adds to it. It's sequential. We can't suddenly go from being zero spiritual development to being a complete, on the other end of the scale, completely understanding all spiritual knowledge, a God, if you like. We can't do that. It doesn't work. It got to, it's a slow progression, sequentially. So I hope that makes sense. Kathy, you could put that in your book, Reincarnation. No, uh, the, the book is about mediumship, I'm afraid. I won't be bringing reincarnation in, but 
and um, we we might do some trans teachings books where we bring in we, we, where what comes through in the trans state some of the quality stuff. So if you follow my quotes, you, a lot of the quotes that I bring through are just little snippets that come out of the trans uh, teachings. I'll hear it. and I think that's fabulous. Let's write that down and let's just type it out and put it up in in, in Facebook or wherever. And so some of that is some of it's very profound and really deep and very powerful. So we may. Put some of these teachings together into a book and one of those may cover the journey of the soul and reincarnation as well so then there may be a book down the line not yet though not yet <laughs> madalif i try to do an automatic writing but i think they are my own thoughts and what has to happen is we have to work through that stage first we work through our own mind our own imagination we what happens is when we're doing inspirational work there's a lot of us in the equation and over time, we learn to minimize us and allow the inspiration to come up with trance. Same again, when you're speaking in trance to begin with, there's a lot of you in the equation and you've got to say the things you say just to allow that part to quieten down and allow the spirit part to come up. In trance, we want 99% spirit and 1% us, 100% spirit and 0% us. But that's very hard to do. The law has been an aspect of self that can creep in, but we're trying to minimize and push it down. So that is a natural stage and you have to just learn to work through it. Don't try and say, well, I won't try automatic writing because if I do it, or if I do inspirational writing, it feels a lot of it feels like me. Don't worry. And remember, you can be inspired by your soul. The inspiration can come from the soul. The inspiration can come from spirit guides and helpers. But the inspiration from your soul is equally valid as the inspiration from spirit helpers. Remember that, you know. People say to me, oh, it's only my soul. No, your soul is so knowledgeable. Your soul is capable of the most amazing wisdom. If only you open to its inspiration. Don't say, oh, it's only my soul. Oh, I wish I'd got spirit instead. Sometimes the soul is fabulous. So if it, even if it does come from you, if it's coming from your soul, it'd be wonderful. Remember, your soul contains all those spiritual qualities from the divine within them. Our job is to unfold them. Our job is to bring them into fruition. But at its core, your soul contains all those qualities. And we can tap back through those spiritual qualities into spiritual knowledge. Absolutely. So I love inspirational work and I highly recommend you do it. Don't focus purely on evidential mediumship. One thing I'll say is that I've never focused purely on evidential mediumship. I, at the same time, I started learning to do evidential mediumship. I started learning to do uh, healing and I, 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 I love healing. And I started to develop my inspirational speaking and writing. And, and then a little bit later, I, I then progressed on to start and develop trance. And I love them all equally. If you said to me, you can only pick and choose one, I can't. They're like, for me, they're all equal. They're all beautiful ways we can express the spirit. And they all help people in so many ways. And it makes us a better medium to have more experience in more areas. It helps develop those spiritual qualities within us. It helps to develop us as people. And the more we develop ourselves spiritually, the better we will be as a medium. And speaking of spiritual self-development, I do have a course on that. So I do have a whole bunch of courses that I've run in the past. I tend to run the courses once and then they're available. The recordings are available. And one of those courses is spiritual self-development, where we learn to work from our soul. We learn to allow the soul to be more a part of our lives. I'm a big fan of that. So check that out if that interests you. OK, next question. Is doing readings for well-known personalities and communities or groups a good idea? I don't really know what you know by mean by doing wealth readings for well-known personalities, because what do you mean? Like do do because generally the well-known personality would not be in that group or community unless it's I say I say I run a, a class. You could do a reading for me. Would I be the well-known personality? Not really. No, I'm not a famous person or a celebrity. But in that group, yeah, you'd all know me as the teacher. So I get that. But. You can't do a reading for somebody who's not there. So unless that person is there in that group, which is probably unlikely to my mind, that's why I'm having a bit of a problem with your question. <laughs> because I'm not really understanding. So I'll tell you what, post a, a comment to help me understand it. And I'll come back to it in a second. Politicians. But, po but politicians are not going to be in your group 
politicians are not, you're not able to get any feedback from them. So you can't do a reading for anybody unless they're able to give you feedback. I don't understand that logic. I don't, it's not, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, I can't do a, re a reading for Boris Johnson, who's the Prime Minister of the UK, because Boris Johnson hasn't asked me to do a reading for him. I, I doubt he ever would, to be frank. I can't do a reading for the Queen because the Queen hasn't asked me for a reading. And if I was going to do a reading for them, I'd want them there in person. I want them to come and sit for me. I want them to, to be there. But the problem is our own knowledge and our own mind can be detrimental because we know a lot. We have pre-existing knowledge. So if they, if they were sitting, then you can work for them, absolutely. But I'd be looking to get information that was not known to me. And I'd be, I'd be looking to connect to their loved ones who I would know nothing whatsoever about. And then they would have to clarify the information to me. So, yeah, you know, I've, I did a video on can you bring through celebrities from the spirit world? And the risk is your mind knows too much. It's also the same reverse scenario if you've got a politician, celebrity, someone really well known in front of you. Your own mind knows a lot. It may know too much. It can get in the way. So I, I, you're, you're best off if you're in practice circles, then generally you're best off working with, with people who you don't know too much about. Uh, and unless that person specifically comes to you for a reading, I wouldn't say it was a brilliant thing necessarily. But if they do come to you for a reading, absolutely, you've got to give them a reading. But look for information that is not known to them. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, question. Why is platform work a goal for mediums instead of individual readings that are more personal? And it depends. Different readings. Some mediums want to do platform work. I always want to do platform work because for me, I'm a spiritualist. It's my religion. Platform work is the, is the window to that religion. It's a major part of my religion. And, and plus, I enjoy it more. But other mediums I know don't want to do platform. They want to do private sittings, individual sittings. And that's their forte. And that's where they devoted their time, their effort. And they can equally help people that way. One is not necessarily better than the other. But you'll be a better medium if you've learned to do both. That's what I believe. You can get away with murder if you just do sittings. And it's all in private and no one gets to hear what you're saying. But when an audience hears what comes out of your mouth. And when other mediums hear what comes out of your mouth. Then... If you like, you're almost being held to account to a little bit higher standards. So that's why. And also platform mediumship will sharpen your mediumship, because if you're working in front of an audience of 30 people and you give generic information, everybody can take it. You've got to get really sharp and accurate and specific with your information and it helps you more. So platform work is a good tool for refining your mediumship. So I, any, if anyone wants to train to do mediumship, I would train them to do both because both are equally valuable. But then it's up to them whether they choose to accept bookings doing public demonstrations or whether they want to do more sittings. Some people go the sittings route. Some people go the public demonstration route. But both are equally valid. One is not more important than another. It's important to recognise that. So, but what I would say is some people who are not brilliant as mediums do sittings and do get away with murder because it's not good and you know they're not maybe they're not capable of getting to the platform but anyone can put themselves up as a medium and start working you know someone comes along and pays you the money and there you go you can advertise heavily and get a lot of business but it doesn't mean you're a good medium no so we have to be careful so hopefully i've answered that question Dawn, would you would like a video on spirit guides, please? Many thanks. Well, I see what I can do on guides. As I say, on, on guides, though, don't forget that there is a special topic video on guides. Uh, guides and helpers, again, lasts about two and a half hours. Various ways and means you can connect with your guides. All sorts of information about guides in that. £12, if that's of interest to anybody, you can partake of that as well. Rather than waiting for me to produce a video on guides, which will only be most of the videos I produce on YouTube tend to be between 10 and 15 minutes. I think shorter ones tend to do better anyway, get more engagement on the shorter ones. So I'm actually trying to shorten them down a little bit and try to keep people's interest. And if you enjoy the channel, do share it with other people. The more the merrier. 
If you enjoy what I do, as I say, hit the like button, do leave me a comment. The more you like and comment on my videos, the more YouTube shows them to other people. It's important. And some of you may have noticed I don't promote them as much on Facebook now. I tend to link you back to my channel. Uh, I, what that was, I found out that if people go to the video through a Facebook link, it actually hurts your video on the channel and YouTube promotes it even less. So if you can find them on the channel, it's better. And if you can link, if you can like and comment, it's better still. So again, if you're enjoying this and you're finding it helpful uh, and you want to support the channel, you can make a donation through Super Chat. You can also make a donation through PayPal Me. Uh, any donations are always appreciated. As I say, I do it for free, but if you would like to donate and buy me a coffee or show your appreciation, that's always wonderful as well. Okay, where are we now? So Mona, I love inspirational writing. I do so quite often and quite amazed at what comes out. It's a beautiful thing to do, you know. It's, an, it's another tool to help express uh, that inspiration from your own soul and that inspiration from those you work with, the guides and helpers. I, I think it's excellent, worth doing, definitely worth doing. Kathy, do only, peop do only people have souls? If you are doing a reading, can pets come through? And thank you so much for your kindness and time. You're welcome. So I do have a video called Animals in Spirit, another video that I have on the channel. And I quite, that I'll, again, that goes into it for a good 10, 15 minutes. But the Precy version is that animals can communicate through a medium. Absolutely. If you have a connection to an animal, that animal still has that connection to you. That bond of love exists and that animal can come to you from the spirit world. And you will be reunited with your animals in the spirit world. You've not lost them. Do they have a soul? Yes. Is their soul the same as a human soul? No. It's different. It's different. Is it as evolved? Probably not, but it's different. It's just, it's probably not more or less evolved. It's just different. So yes, animals have souls. Yes, they can communicate. And, but if you're working platform, we train you not to work with a pet by itself because it by itself, it's not necessarily, you know, it doesn't meet the need of demonstrating evidence of survival of the human soul because it's an animal but often I will get people come through and then they'll bring through the dog I'll be working with someone I'll be bringing through their loved one and then I become aware of their animal around them and then I'll start working with the animal and explain the animal what it looks like how it feels its personality the connection they had all of that's there in the energy from spirit from that animal that animal will love you that animal will be there for you so if that sounds of interest, check out the video Animals in Spirit and that will help you immensely as well, I'm sure. Jenny, are mediums empaths? If so, do you encourage daily spiritual boundaries and nightly energetic cleaning? Thank you. Now, in the UK, we do not use the term empath. I don't use the term empath. You'll never hear it come out of my mouth in my teachings because that's not part of my training in the UK. What exactly impact is an empath? I don't even know, to be honest, because I know in the States there's various definitions. You know, I talk about highly sensitive people. That's all I talk about. And all mediums, by definition, have to be highly sensitive people. You know, if you say, oh, you take upon yourself other people's um, feelings or emotions, that's just being sensitive. It's being psychic. You know, if you're psychic and sensitive, that's what's going to happen. So I, I don't use the term empaths. Do I encourage daily spiritual boundaries and nightly energetic clearings? No. Uh, again, I do. I have a series of videos on rituals and mediumship and myths and mediumship where I talk about protection, closing down, grounding and various rituals. And I don't recommend any rituals, really, because I don't find them particularly helpful. Uh, so, you know, what are you clearing yourself for? People say to me, oh, you know, I, I, if I go to circle, do I need to clear myself afterwards? Energetic cleansing and bang gongs over me and spray myself in sprays and all that stuff. And the answer is no. What, why do you need to do that? No, you don't. Nothing sticks to you. Now, if you're doing healing and you're giving healing to a patient and you find that their condition does stay with you a little bit afterwards, then all you need to do is sit and ask spirit to lift it away and to imagine maybe some white light coming in to help remove it. That's as far as I would go, but only if there was a problem. If there's no problem, no. Do you need to 
put barriers and shields up and surround yourself with a white light and get a shield of protection and a sword. No, none of that. I don't teach any of that. It just, it sounds crazy. And the problem is that then puts ideas in people's minds that there's something to be bothered about. There's energies that are going to jump upon you. And it's not really the case. It's very rare. I'd say it's less than 1% of people have problems with picking up on the energies of others. And often that's a subconscious want to do so as well, a subconscious need. You know, I never really, uh, I do sit-ins, I do work, spiritual work, I do healing. I don't take any of my patients' symptoms home with me. No, let it go. Let, let it go back to God. It's not, it, it's not destined to be with me. No, I connect, I blend, I let, a, I let a flow of healing energy from spirit come through to me. And when I finish, that's it. If you like, you've got to have strict discipline when you're working or you're not. You finished it, you stop it, you bring yourself back to normal. That's the grounding I talk about of returning yourself to a normal, natural state. That's what I teach with grounding. No, not closing down your chakras and cover yourself in pots and pans and turning all your lights off and no, none of that. I don't teach any of that. So I've probably not helped you because you probably have been taught some of those ideas and you're probably saying everything I'm teaching now goes against that. If everything I say doesn't make sense to you, let it go. I don't mind. If it does make sense to you, go with it. But no, I don't really teach empaths because it, I think it's a very American terminology, very American teachings. OK, Ollie, when you're sitting in the power, is it normal to still get random thoughts? Yes, absolutely. You know, when you're sitting, any thought can come in. But what we have to do is gently let it come and go. It's like the meditations of the Eastern tradition. The thought comes, hello thoughts, you're not welcome, you need to go. It's like a bus. It comes in, it goes out. It comes in, it goes out. Yeah, you know. And what happens if you get thoughts, it will pull you out the power and you get back in and you build, go back and connect. And then you'll think, oh, what am I having for dinner tonight? Oh, I've lost it. Go back and rebuild. And then you're connecting and then all of a sudden you'll hear something outside, a siren, a police siren or something. And you've been drawn to it and you've lost it. You go back and you rebuild it and then another random thought comes in and you've lost it. So it's, it's learning to build. And when you're working with spirit, things will happen in the room. You'll lose it. A distraction, a disturbance, you'll lose it. Someone will say something to you, will catch you by surprise, you'll lose it. So it's brilliant training for getting back into that power. It's the best training there is for the mind, for mediumship. Absolutely. Mona, good point about private versus platform readings. Absolutely. No one thing is better than the other, I don't, I, I would say. It's important to recognise that. Maria, at what point do you think it's beneficial to work with a mentor one-to-one? -one? Now, my views on this, again, may surprise you. And my views on this, again, may be different to what other people say, may offend you, may upset people. Who will say? So... I used to do one-to-one -one mentoring and one-to-one -one teaching. And I stopped doing it after a while, and I'll tell you for why. Because everybody coming to me was wanting a shortcut. Everybody coming to me was not willing to do the work. Everyone coming to me, I'd say, I cover all of that in great detail in my mediumship classes. If you buy those, you'll have all the information. No, no, I want you to tell me. It's like, well, I can't teach any better than I taught in that class. So if you don't want the classes, you, you know, so what happens is people want shortcuts. Or I'll say, well, come along to this class and this workshop. And no, 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 no. I want, I want you to teach me to do it yourself. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You'll learn by working with other people in classes and workshops. And they don't want to do it. And what I find is people think they're going to go much further in a one-to-one -one mentoring. And in my experience, you won't. In my experience, it's the reverse. Because generally those chasing one-to-ones are not doing the graft, the work that needs to be done to make it happen. So there's different mentorship schemes. There's mentorship schemes where you join a tutor and you work for 10 weeks or you work across 20 classes or a year and the tutor watches you and helps you and helps your progression. I don't call it mentorship. I call it progressive courses. It's like a progressive scheme. That's good because you've got one tutor working with you over multiple occasions helping you. But generally, they would work with you in a group, not on a one-to-one. -one. So that's important. You know, the only benefit you really get from a one-on-one -on -one mentorship would be asking specific questions to a tutor to get an answer where you're confused. But that's why I run classes like this, so you can bring the question along and I'll answer them for you. And you haven't got to pay for a one-to-one. -one. 
So yeah, you get it for free. So at that, at that point, I should mention the PayPal me. If you want to make a PayPal donation, you can. If anybody would like to do a Super Chat donation, you can. So yeah, so you can, if you have questions and queries, you can get them answered. If you want a spiritual appraisal, you can do that as well. But you can, but you can hire a medium to do a spiritual appraisal for you anyway. It's, it's you know, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be done through one-to-one -one mentorship. But again, for me, I stopped doing it because it, I, I was finding it not helpful to me. And what I was finding was if I taught in a group setting, I taught, I teach theory. And if you want the best theory that Martin will give, go to my theory teachings. Because when I teach theory, I get so engrossed and involved in it. And, you know, I dig deep. And I can't repeat, like, what I've given you now is remembered from all the teachers I've ever done. It's just to remember what I can remember in the moment. But it, I cannot give you the depth that I would if I was devoting a whole class to guides and helpers. And I'd been thinking about it for days on weeks on end. And I've created, like, multiple, multiple, multiple notes on it. Very structured, very logical. All these different practices. What you'd get in that class would be far beyond what I could teach you in a one-to-one. -one because the class is focused and directed to it. So I would, when people ask me, I want to know about guides and helpers, I'd point them at my class on guides and helpers where it's been distilled down and sorted out and that's the best I can do. If you want to know about spiritual self-development, I'll point you to one of my courses on spiritual self-development. If you want to know about confidence, I'll point you my course on confidence. If you want to know how to get better evidence, I'll point you at my course on getting better evidence, which is, you know, four two hour classes with real depth to it. You know, if you did a one to one with me and say how to get better evidence, you'd just get a fraction of the information. It wouldn't get as much. So that's the point. So so one on ones. I don't personally recommend it. Mentorship schemes where you're in a group and it's kind of a progressive training scheme. That's good. And the progressive teaching schemes as well. That's good as well. No problem with those. But where you just go one on one with a tutor, you might need that once in a blue moon, maybe one session in a year to help you out if you're having an issue at a specific point in time. But beyond that, you don't really need it. And then remember, there are no shortcuts. You have to do the work. It's like if I want to play an instrument and I couldn't be bothered to learn my scales and if I want to play an instrument, I couldn't be bothered to learn, learn my chords. If I go along to a tutor, make me a better whatever, drummer, pianist, guitarist, they'll say, you've got to go away and practice your scales. You've got to go away and learn your chords. And, you know, there's no shortcut. They can't teach you that in that moment in time. You have to go away and do it yourself and you have to go away and learn the flow. You've got to go away and put all the work in behind the scenes. It's no different with mediumship. So I don't recommend one to ones if we try a shortcut because there is no shortcut. Kathy, I'm very much looking forward to your books. That's wonderful. Me too. I so am I. Just need to get more than written. <laughs> Mona, do you think that rituals are practiced due to religious influence and individuals brought up in, up in, in or practices and just carried over into mediumship? Absolutely. Especially if you've been taught that there's evil spirits. You'll do start doing all sorts of weird and wonderful rituals to keep away evil spirits, which I don't believe that we can be affected by spirits who are evil. I don't believe in evil spirits, part one. Part two, anybody who had negative intent towards us is automatically through natural law not able to come to us anyway. So I don't teach any protection whatsoever. Over 20 years, I'm not done protection and here I am unharmed. So check out my protection video. The mediums need protection. But a lot of it is rituals that come that are spillovers from religion. Absolutely. Spillovers from fears and anxieties. And if someone teaches you religion or tells you something bad that can happen to you, then you worry about it and you do all these rituals. And then if they teach them to their students down the line, a lot of it is just passed down from one teacher to student to teacher to student without any real logic or, you know, some of the early circles I went to, we had to open up and close down and do protection rituals and stuff. And I was like, really? And then I'd go to some places like the Arthur Finley College where there was never... In the whole week, not one protection ritual. No, not one opening up or closing down. And you ask the question, it's like, you don't need it. Why would you need it? Oh, okay. And once you get used to not doing it at all, you don't need it. So, yeah. So, definitely.
Jenny, your question, what are your thoughts on automatic writing and mediumship? Could they be used in tandem? Um, not easily, no. They're different. So remember this diagram I showed at the beginning? So mediumship is a highly active, energized state. That's your mediumship. Your inspiration, which is where, if you like, it's not automatic writing as such, it's inspirational writing. Very, very few people are capable of automatic writing, in my experience. It's a term that is used wrongly, I believe. Inspirational writing, very passive. Opposite polar extreme to, to me mental evidential mediumship. So it's very, it's almost impossible to combine the two because they're different states. We do them from different states. The only person I ever know who's combined the two was Gordon Higginson. When he was doing a demonstration of mediumship, he had a, a lectern in front of him and he had a piece of paper on, he had a pen. And while he was doing evidential mediumship, he was also able to write out links using automatic writing. But he was exceptional. And you'd have to develop yourself to a pretty high standard for that to take place. Us mere mortals, I don't think we'd be able to do it that easily. So I don't see an easy way of combining it at the t together in tandem. Could you develop, can you develop them separately at the in, the in the same time frame? Of course, you can develop healing and mediumship and develop trance and mediumship. You can develop inspirational work and mediumship. You can develop inspirational work and healing. You can, all of it can be developed independently. But when you're doing it, you need to do each one from the right state and you need to understand the dynamics and the mechanics of each one properly. So I can't do trance from the same mindset that I'm doing evidential mediumship for. I can't do psychic work from the same energy that I'm doing inspirational work from. It's, they're all different. They're all different energy states, different altered states of awareness, and each one has its own purpose. So, But once you learn the mechanics behind each one, you can do each one Absolutely. You know, I was told early on that I couldn't possibly develop mediumship and healing at the same time. And the answer is you can. People who tell you that just do not understand the mechanics or the dynamics. Simple. But there you go. Um, Peter, do you teach dream interpretation or have a viewpoint about dreams? This is another area where I'm going to differ completely from a heck of a lot of people. I don't do any dream interpretation. Don't believe in dream interpretation. Think it's all a load of... Yeah, that. You know, we dream. I, I've got a background in hypnotherapy. I'm a trained hypnotherapist, got a knowledge, great deal of knowledge of psychology. When we're dreaming, it's our subconscious mind's way of getting rid of crud within our mind and letting it come out, letting it come to the surface. You know, people who read so much into their dreams, you know, you can, you can waste a lot of your life that way if you want. Why not just do some mediumship or do some psychic work? or do something else and focus it and channel it and know you're doing it right. Whereas, how do you know what comes up in a dream is anything other than just a creation of your subconscious mind? You don't. And you can read so much into it. And some people, you know, that their lives are given by what their dreams have said. Oh, my, something came up in my dream. That's, oh, that's an omen. I better not go out of the house this week because something bad could happen. And no, forget about it. Yeah, last night I had a dream about meeting the Queen. The Queen came to stay with me. The Queen of England came to stay with me. And then in my dream, I uh, somehow I won a huge building that needed millions spending on it to convert it into residential, residential flats. Now, these are the most bizarre dreams. It's just my mind is processing crud from the year, from, the, from my life. It's, there's, you know, there's nothing to read into it. You know, am I, am I going to be meeting royalty because I had a dream about the Queen came round? I don't think so. You know, I, I, so I don't do dream interpretation. Never have, never will. For me, I put that on the flaky spectrum, the flaky spectrum of activities that I can't really see the point of. That's where I put it, you know, so. <laughs> but if, that, if, if you do dream interpretation, you find it helpful and it works for you, great. Just ignore everything I say. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't fit for me. It's not part of my experience or it's not an interest I have. And if I'm not interested in something, I can't do it. And I have to be honest. But if it works for you, go with it. If it works for you and you get enjoyment from it, brilliant. You know, some people do astrology. I don't do astrology. Again, it's not me. But I can see how it helps them. I can see how dream interpretation may help some people but it doesn't work for me. And with the knowledge I have about psychology, I just think so much of it is just our own mind processing stuff. So yeah. 
Only thing I will say that is different is those rare dreams where we meet our loved ones in the spirit world, which have a very profound feeling and feel really different. In those instances, I do believe we are having a connection and a meeting with our loved ones in spirit. But that's the only dream that I believe to be truly different. If you maybe meet your guides in the spirit world and it has a profound feeling, again, I'll accept that. But the rest of it, I don't get carried away or excited by it. So Jenny, thank you very much so very much for your super chat it is greatly appreciated that is wonderful so we appear to have run out of questions unless anybody has any more questions again if you if you would like to make a donation you can use the paypal link as well at the top of the screen again if you're enjoying this and you haven't hit the like button yet do that hit the like button for me if you uh if you're watching this on the replay and you're enjoying it leave me a comment if you've got any ideas that you'd like me to talk about on my videos that I upload to YouTube, do let me know. I have got about the next six or so planned out. They're, they're work in progress. But after that, if you've got some ideas, let me have them and I can add them to the list. I know some people occasionally send me links, uh, send me emails and let me know or send me a, a private message on Facebook to give me suggestions. You can do that as well if you want to. You don't want to put it in the public domain. But yeah, happy to have topics to talk about and do videos on that meet what you would like and if you enjoyed the one the, the meditation i did recently on the meditation to meet your loved ones do let me know because i don't know if any of you in the room saw that one and uh but what, what I, I what i did notice was it got a lot less engagement than i thought it would and i, I wondered if people might be interested in meditations so if you are, let me know and I can do more of those. But if not, that's fine. If you prefer my logical, practical, down-to-earth teachings without the fluff, that's great as well. <laughs> Mona, thank you. You're so helpful. My, 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 it's my, it's my pleasure to do so. If I can help in some small way, if I can bring knowledge that helps you, that's wonderful as well. So I in the absence of any more questions, I'm going to bring the, uh, the the live chat to a close. So if you haven't checked out the, the latest videos I've done, which was sitting in the power of the key to mediumship, how to practice mediumship, which I highly recommend. That's got 10 tips. That is an excellent video, if I say so myself. I was very impressed with that one. Uh, meditation to meet your loved ones. If you haven't seen that one, do check it out. And my latest one, the talk on being spiritual. Do check those out. As I say, there's also the Sitting in the Power series is worth checking out. The Myths in Mediumship series to cover all those ones. That's worth checking out as well. So Holly, your interest in meditations, that's wonderful. So yeah, so I'm going to thank you all for coming. Uh, I do hope that you've enjoyed our class today. And I, I do do them every month. The next one will be in September, will be Tuesday, the 28th of September. If you don't want to put it in your diary, a date for your diary. But glad you came and joined me. Hope you got lots from it. Look forward to seeing you again in the next one. And for those who joined the replay, I do hope you've enjoyed it. Bye for now. See you again.